Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus. We are here again in front of your presence, Lord, because we want to follow you. We want to do the best uh, for you and for our neighbors, Lord. At this moment, we ask you for your presence and everything that we are going to learn, Lord. We can uh, retain it and we can apply it into our life and with others as well, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, it's interesting how fasting can reverse um, diseases like uh, diabetes, like obesity, like um, hypertension. And one of the diseases that is emerging now in 2000, since 2014, 2015, it's uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson, and any other neurological disease. Back in, when I was 14 years old, we were driving back from the graduation of my oldest brother. He was graduating from the university. And we start to drive back home <coughs> during the night, around 11, 12. I remember that my uncle, he was the driver. And I remember very well, before the trip, he was drinking some cup of coffee, probably two or three cups of Coca-Cola, probably some other um, stimulants in order to keep him awake, right? Um, it was a trip of around eight hours. But in the middle of the trip, he started to have some stomach discomfort, like uh, symptoms of acid reflux. I remember in the car, it was my father, my mother, my grandmother, and myself. My father had to take over, and he started to drive because my uncle was not able to drive anymore. I remember that he was sitting in the back seat of the car with me and my mom. And I remember that he was with a terrible pain on his chest. I was 14 years old. I was not thinking nothing serious. My grandma, he had an anti-acid in his purse. And he gave it to him. She gave it to him. He is still with the pain, terrible pain on his chest. But everybody was thinking that it was a consequence of this acid reflux because he was eating too much the last night. We got home around eight in the morning. The next day, he went running to the hospital. And interesting thing that four hours later, he was dying a consequence of a massive heart attack. The interesting things, brothers and sisters, is that we could prevent this issue. Nobody knew that he was diabetic. Nobody knew that probably he was hypertensive as well, hyper, hyper, hypertensive. And four hours later, he was dying, or he died. We can prevent these situations. The picture that I have of my uncle, he was a very respected person. He raised my cousins, all of them. They were working for the church. They were working for the conference. But how you can explain this that nobody was aware about the situation of my uncle? He was a very, very hard worker person. But we could prevent this issue. How old he was? Probably 62, 65 years old. Of course, he was obese. He had diabetes. He was presenting a frame of a cardiovascular disease, right? It's interesting that um, the causes of this in the 1900s, it was 50%. 53% they were a consequence of 
infectious diseases. Well, what happened in 2010? What happened in 2019? What happened in 2019? The population is dying a consequence of 32% a consequence of cancer and 33% a consequence of cardiovascular diseases. And there is another disease that is emerging, as I mentioned before, neurological disease. Probably you know or you, you know or you know somebody that could reverse cancer. But until now, I don't know anybody that could reverse Alzheimer. Mm, right? And we spoke about Alzheimer the last, um, the last um, session about intestinal permeability and how it's related with all these neurological diseases, even autoimmune diseases, right? The map of uh, US of obesity, you can see here, um, states like uh, Texas, Louisiana, Missouri, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, Oklahoma, South, South Carolina, they are presenting the highest rates on obesity. But when you see the map, or the same map of cancer, the same states with the highest rate in obesity, they are present, presenting the same rates of incidence or onset of cancer. 10, no, 90,000 cases of cancer, they are related with, with obesity every year, every year. There are some who will be benefited more by abstinence from food for a day or two every week than by any amount of treatment or medical advice to fast, what? One day a week will be of incalculable benefit of to them. Abstinence from food for a day or two every week. Hippocrates, who was a father of the Western medicine, who was a father of the medicine, he portrayed this also. Our medicine should be our food, but to eat when you are sick is to feed what? Your sickness. Instead of using medicine, rather fast a day. And but because when you are fasting, your immune system eats boosting up to 30%. Your blood glucose levels, they are low. Your immune system is working better. And you are producing some other compounds that they are going to be attacking or regenerate every cell in your body. We have the best example, Jesus. He was fasting for how many days? 40 days, and probably you can say, well, probably because he was at this divine power. But the truth is also that an average person of 140 pounds and with a height average of five, six, five, seven, it's able to fast at least 140 days. Sorry, 40 days. So 40 days. 140 pounds. <laughs> but you will see later, because 140 days, it's nothing of some other persons they have been fasting more than 140 days, right? One of the first physicians here in US that discarded the use of medications, it was Isaac Jennings. By the way, Isaac Jennings, he was the father of the hygienic treatment. Hygienic treatment, well, he used to encourage people to fast using vegetarian diet, pure water, sunshine, clean air, exercise, emotional balance, and rest. One of the first physicians or that was working with Ellen G. White, it was Dr. Kellogg, right? And they found it. They built this sanatorium, Barrow Creek, right? And John Harry Kellogg, he was one of the pioneers, or one of the, or the best physicians for his time that it was in the world, probably, right? And John Harry Kellogg, he was also advocating the use of fasting. Something interesting happened in the 1918s. It was a flu epidemic. 
And this epidemic killed around the world almost 20 millions of people, 20 millions of people. While the hospitals of conventional medicine, they were losing at least 33% of all their cases of this flu epidemic. By the way, it's, it's called also the Spanish epidemic. McFadden's sanitarians, Battle Creek sanitarians, and some other sanitarians here in the US, they were almost having 100% of healing. How? With hydrotherapy, with vegetarian diet, with um, probably enemas, but also with fasting, sunbathing. That's why LGY mentioned this in 1902. There are some who will be benefited more by abstaining from food for a day or two every week than by any amount of treatment or medical advice. At this point, conventional medicine is pointing out to fasting like the magic pill. But please, there is not a magic pill. Fasting is coming with the natural laws of health, sunshine, rest, water, emotional balance and trusting in God, right? The most important. But what happens when we are eating? Okay, so when you are eating, you are eating what? Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, right? What's gonna happen with the carbohydrates? Well, the carbohydrates, they are gonna be break down and converted into glucose, and your body is gonna be storage, this glucose, into your liver and into your muscle cells in another compound that is called glycogen, okay? And just remember glycogen, okay? This is in your liver and in your muscle cells, in your muscles. When you are eating a lot of refined carbohydrates and you are loading, loading like the capacity of the body to store its glycogen, you are going to start to convert this remind of glucose that your body is not using or is not storing as a glycogen, your body is going to be storing as a fat, rest as a fat. And where is going to be storage this fat in your body? Well, it's going to be storage in your abdomen probably, it's going to be storage in your muscle cells, it's going to be storage in your liver, promoting what? Fatty liver promoting in your muscle cells a condition that's called insulin resistant, which is the first step in order to develop diabetes. Why? Because you were consuming a lot of carbohydrates. These carbohydrates, they were converting in glycogen, but the remind blood sugar that your body couldn't convert in glycogen because your storage was already low or full, your body is converted in fat. Okay. So, and this is the action of one hormone that is called insulin. Insulin. Mm, normal levels of insulin is really good. I mean, we need insulin in order to maintain the normal levels of glucose, right? But when you have a high levels of insulin, you are going to be promoting what? High levels of glucose high levels of insulin, and the insulin is going to convert glucose into, into fat. So, okay, this is from carbohydrates. So now what's happened with the fat? Well, the fat also, they are going to be break down, and some of them we need fat in order to maintain or in order to build up every cell in your body. Every cell in your body, it's built up from fat, every membrane, in your cell, I mean every cell in your body has a membrane and it's built up from fat. But the problem is what kind of fat have you, are you eating? Because if you are eating only saturated fat, you are going to build up your cells from what? From saturated fat, promoting chronic inflammation, promoting insulin resistance, and promoting many other situations as well, right? So we need fats, but what kind of fat? It's the question, right? And what about proteins? Well, when we are eating proteins, these proteins are gonna be breakdown in amino acids, and these amino acids, we need it in order to perform, in order to maintain many 
um, biochemical pathway in your body, and also to build our muscles, right? This is the three components of our diet, proteins, carbohydrates, and fat, okay? So, this is the insulin, and this is one of the hormones that I am scared about this hormone, insulin. And if you are type 1 diabetic, please continue taking your insulin. Um, if you are type 2 diabetes, please try to reverse this issue in order to prevent the use of insulin. 10% of all the cancers are related with high levels of insulin or hyperinsulinemia. Okay, so the work of the insulin, as I mentioned before, is maintain the blood glucose levels in order, okay? But also produce fat from sugar, okay? Sugar that, you, that your body is not using as energy. But also the insulin is going to promote what? The elevation of the production of lipogenesis, the pr production of lipids in your liver, production of lipids in your muscle cells. Not only that, if you have a high levels of insulin, you're never going to be able to lose weight because this pathway of oxidation of your fat is going to be blocking by the high levels of insulin. Mm -hmm. High levels of insulin. That's why when you have a person with diabetes and you are um, using insulin with them, it's very, very difficult that they are going to be losing weight because the problem of diabetes is not insulin deficiency. The problem of diabetes is more insulin resistance. And you are giving them more insulin, you are feeding this cycle. High levels of insulin, more insulin resistance. More fat and more insulin resistance, right? So, we need to break down this cycle. And in the other side, we have another hormone that is called glucagon. And the glucagon is going to do the opposite of the insulin. The glucagon is the hormone also that your pancreas is going to be producing. And I like this hormone, right? Because it's going to do the opposite of the insulin. The glucagon is going to elevate the blood flow to your brain and to your kidneys. The glucagon is going to accelerate or is going to promote or is going to stimulate the fat oxidation. The glucagon is going to stimulate the liver in order to break down fat, promoting the desintoxication or the detox or the fat breakdown from your liver, reversing Fatty liver. As I mentioned before, fatty liver, we need to be careful with this condition because fatty liver, you can have like a 5 to 7 percent to develop a cirrhosis in within 5 to 7 years when after the diagnosis of fatty liver, right? And then fatty liver, cirrhosis, and then hepatocarcinoma or cancer of the liver, right? So not only that, glucagon also, it's going to enhance the function of your kidneys is going to enhance also, it says something here, it's going to enhance or elevate the hepatocyte survival. What is that hepatocyte survival? Well, hepatocyte, it's the, function, the functional cell of your liver and it's going to enhance the life or it's going to enhance the, fun the function of your liver cells as well, right? So. These two hormones, they work together, but not at the same time. If you have a high levels of insulin, you will have a depletion of your glucagon. If you have a high levels of glucagon, it's because you have a high level, low levels of insulin. Okay? So, when you are eating proteins, specific proteins and carbohydrates, the fat, they are not going to increase your insulin. That's why fat doesn't make you fat. Sugar is going to make you fat. So that's why ketogenic diet, <laughs> they are losing weight because this reason, right? But it's not really healthy, this diet. OK, so um, you have a high levels of insulin. You will have a high, low levels of glucagon, OK? 
If you have a high levels of glucagon, you will have a, high, a low levels of insulin. So we need to maintain this balance. Okay, so one of the simple ways in order to maintain this balance is what? Well, having plant-based diet, but also this is the rationale of fasting in order to enhance your glucagon levels. Because when you are elevating the glucagon levels, as a consequence, your liver is going to be break down fat. Your kidneys and your brain, they are going to receive more blood flow. And you are going to be producing some chemicals or compounds in your body that is called what? Ketones. Ketones bodies. Probably you heard already about ketones. Back in the days, ketones, I mean, scientists, they were saying that ketones, they were only like a, a waste, waste of toxins compounds from uh, proteins. But now we know that ketones, it's one of the target points of fasting. Ketosis or ketogenic states, right? So what happening when you are or when you are fasting? Okay, the first 12 of to 14 hours of fasting, your body is going to be functioning by your energy storage. Okay, and what is that energy storage? Is that glycogen? Remember, glycogen is just a molecule with water and glucose that's going to be storage in your liver and in your muscle cells. Okay, when you are fasting for six hours every meal, your glycogen is going to maintain your body functioning. During the night that you are not eating for six, seven hours, your glycogen, I mean your liver, is going to be producing glucose from glycogen, right? But what happened, what happened when you are fasting for 24 hours, for 72 hours? Well, the glycogen after 12 to 14 hours of fasting is going to be depleted. And you are going to be producing energy from what? Ah? <laughs> from water? <laughs> no, not from water. Um, from fat. From fat. And we are looking this point. We are looking this target. We are, we are targeting this to promote the fat breakdown. But 12 hours of fasting sometimes is not enough. 14 hours of fasting is not enough. 16 hours of fasting is not enough. And by the way, I mean persons or women with a, a risk of uh, breast cancer, they can decrease the risk of breast cancer when they are fasting this uh, 16 hours every day. And how you are going to do that? Well, two meals a day. This is the rational. That's why LNG, I mentioned, well, you, it's better in some situations for some individuals to eat only two meals a day in order to have in these 16 hours and eating only in a window out of eight hours, probably, right? So, um, Ketones. Okay, when you deplete already your glycogen, you are going to be producing these ketones. Okay, and it's interesting because ketone states different from healthy cells. Most cancer cells cannot what utilize ketone bodies as their primary energy source, mainly because they do not usually express enzymes that convert ketones to a to acetylcholine. Well, it's just a compound of energy. I mean, they cannot produce energy from ketones, the cancer cells. Why? Because the cancer cells, they have a problem in their mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the organ that is going to produce energy and is going to maintain um, life your, your cells. But the cancer cells, they work abnormally and they cannot produce energy just from ketones. Some of them, right? So that's why this is the rationale in how it's related ketones and or fasting and cancer. So 
ketones, right? That's why the ketogenic diet, because you are eating 90% of fat, and that fat is going to be converted right away in your liver into ketones, right? And these ketones, you will have all these benefits from there, right? We have another hormone that is called the insulin growth factor one. And this insulin growth factor one is produced by the hepatocytes, I mean, in your liver, and it's going to be uh, stimulated by the action of what? Growth hormone, insulin, and protein-rich diets. Insulin and protein, they are going to uh, stimulate the production of this insulin growth factor one. And what is the importance of this insulin growth factor one? Well, this IGF-1 plays a major physiological role. Uh, when you are 15 years old, when you are 16 years old, and you need to have a high levels of this hormone at that, time, at that time, because it's going to help you to grow up. Every cell in your body is going to be proliferating or multiplying by the action of the IGF-1, okay? But in the adulthood, you won't need it or you don't need to have a high levels of the IGF-1. Why? Because if you have a prostate cancer, if you have a breast cancer, by the way, I mean, uh, many, many, many males, they have like a micro tumors in the prostate and they need just a trigger in order to multiply these tumors. What could be the trigger? Well, it could be high levels of insulin or it could be high levels also of protein, specific animal proteins. And these two components, they are going to promote or they are going to stimulate the elevation of the insulin growth factor one. And the insulin growth factor one, it seems like uh, is going to increase the tumor risk and worse the cancer prognosis. And in what situations you will have high levels of insulin growth factor one. When you have a high levels of insulin, that's the only way. But why? Because the insulin is going to promote in your liver the production of this hormone. So there is another situation in order why to be fasting, right? After 72 hours, after 24 hours, you will start to produce energy from fat and a very low amount from proteins, okay? Very low amount of proteins. But don't get concerned about it if you are a bodybuilder and you are concerned about your protein because your body is gonna switch very rapidly the use of proteins in order to store it, these amino acids, preventing starvation, right? In 1950, uh, the University of Minnesota, um, it took uh, 32 volunteers who fasted for up to eight months, and they compared, they compared the deprivation observations made during the Second World War. The interesting thing that during these eight months, they, eight, eight, eight months, they were only um, having uh, water-only fasting. Um, and during the Second World War, uh, we had, or uh, we saw many uh, malnourished um, <coughs> situations, malnourishment situations because they were eating probably only fat, because they were eating probably only carbohydrates or proteins, right? We don't, I don't exactly know why. But interesting that fasting for the same period of time did not cause any vitamin or mineral deficiency. So you can fat, fast as long as you have what? Energy storage. When you deplete all your energy storage, I wouldn't advise you to fast because yes, in that situation, you will be, it's called a, like a, a self-cannibalism. You are going to be eating yourself from, you are going to be, um, yes, I mean, having like, um, using your proteins or your amino acids in order to maintain your body functioning and this is dangerous, right? So the research mentioned that cardiovascular disease, and hypertension, diabetes, epilepsy, obesity, pancreatitis, um, psoriasis, asthma, cancer, they are going to be positive affected by this therapy. So 
what happens in your brain when you are fasting? Well, when you are fasting, you are going to be producing the ketones. And it seems like uh, the ketones, they are going to travel to your brain. By the way, the ketones is the alternative energy for your brain. People with Alzheimer, they have up to 20 to 30% of deficit of glucose uptake, okay? They cannot uptake glucose. So they need an alternative source of energy. So by the way, per people with uh, around 65 years and above, they have around 14 to 16 percent of deficit or decrease in glucose uptake. What I mean is that this category of people, they need an alternative source of energy. And this alternative source of energy, it could be the ketones, by the way. They are the only fatty acid that they can cross, they can cross the uh, um, the blood-brain barrier. There is a, there, they are the medium-chain fatty acid or the medium-chain triglycerides or the MCT oil. Did you hear about the MCT oil, right? Well, the hydrox beta-hydroxybutyrate or the acetoacetate, they are two these kind of oils that they can cross the blood-brain barrier. They are the only oils. And one of them is on the ketones. So the ketones, it could act as an alternative energy for these kind of persons, right? So what happened in your brain? Well, this your brain is going to be acting by these ketones, promoting energy to, I mean, releasing or promoting or giving the energy to your neurons or, or uh, brain cells into promote some other compounds or some neurotrophic factors or brain factors, and one of them is the BNDF. The BNDF is one of the neurotrophic factors that it can enhance the communication in, in between your neurons or neuroplasticity, and also it can promote the production of new neurons or neurogenesis. And these compound, compounds, you are going to be producing only this BNDF, only when you are fasting. But well, there is another therapy for this, and it's exercise. When you are exercised and when you are fasting, you are going to be producing these neurotrophic factors in order to enhance the communication between your brain cells and not only that, but in your hippocampal area, the area of the memory, you are going to be producing more neurons, a consequence of these mechanisms of fasting, right? But not only that, I mean, it says like it's going to promote the yeah, antioxidant uh, productions, it's going to promote also the mitochondrial biogenesis. And what is this mitochondrial biogenesis? The mitochondrial, some books, they mention mitochondrial biogenesis or mitochondrial respiration. That is just the mitochondrial. Remember that I mentioned that it's the organ, the very tiny organ in every cell in your body that is going to produce energy. But also it's going to produce energy, but also it's going to produce, produce toxins and also is related with the kind of energy that you are given to the mitochondria. Is it going to produce toxins or energy, right? And one of the simple ways in order to regenerate the function of this mitochondria or enhance the, 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 the function of the mitochondria is fasting and, and exercise, right? And one of the simple things in order to release or regenerate any DNA mutation, it's, uh, it's with fasting, DNA repair. Okay, fasting is not about time. Fasting is more about the abstinence of food, abstinence of nutrient, right? When you are drinking, you are not um, stimulating any um, gastrointestinal, um, well, just some mechanisms, but, uh, but not like production of some acids, right? So fasting is not about time. You can be fasting for one hour, two hours, three hours, six hours, or these six hours of fasting between meals. 
that is called the interdigestive period, okay? But it's just the gap between meals. What's happening in these six hours of fasting between meals and why is it so important? As I mentioned before, there is not such a thing like a healthy snack. There does not exist healthy, healthy snack because this reason. When you are fasting, you are going to be producing another hormone that is called the motilin hormone. And the motilin is released during fasting or the interdigestive period. The MNC or the, migra the migration motor complex or peristalsis, that is a propulsive movement initiated during fasting that begins in the stomachs and moves on the digestive material from the stomach and the small intestine into the colon. So the motilin hormone is going to enhance the peristalsis movement. It's going to enhance the regular movement of your stomach, uh, small intestine, and colon in order to clear out, to clear out um, the gut and prepare for the next meal, right? But this is something very important also, because this movement, it says here, that is going to prevent what? The backflow of bacteria from your colon into the ileum, and its subsequent overgrowth in the distal ileum. Remember intestinal permeability? Remember SIBO or SIBO, or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth? How did it start everything? Well, this this biosis of bacteria imbalance, there is a valve between your ili between your yes, between your small intestine and your large intestine. And this valve is called the ileocecal valve. And this valve is gonna be acting, or it's gonna yeah, it's gonna be acting by the action of the motilin. And if you are not producing good levels of motilin, because after two hours after your breakfast, you were eating snacks, you are going to disrupt the functioning of this ileocecal valve, promoting what? Migration from bacteria from your colon crossed to your small intestine, producing something that is called dysbiosis, producing something that is called small intestinal bacteria overgrowth producing something that's called intestinal permeability and producing something that's called the leaky gut syndrome that is related with autoimmune disease and many other conditions. Why? Because probably you were eating snacks. That's, that's yes, it's very simple, right? So, um, six hours of at least five to six hours in order to maintain this propulsive or peristalsis movement in order, right? What about a caloric restriction diet? Well, it seems like uh, mice, so mice these, anim these little tiny animals of, in the laboratory, when they were feeding like uh, with this restriction diet or caloric restriction diet, when you are eating, when you are not overeating, and when you are eating all, only like 80% uh, of your capacity of your stomach, they were surviving, or the lifespan increased up to 20 to 40, no, up to 40 percent when they were when they, they when they were eating only up to 60 to 80 percent of the capacity of their stomachs, and this is called the caloric restriction diet, right? But not only that, in particular, uh, restriction diet on. Um, or dietary restriction has been shown to improve arterial blood flow, vasodilation, and to delay the development of atherosclerosis. I mean, it's just cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, right? But what happened with cardiovascular disease? Well, it seems like fasting is going to deplete the levels of your triglycerides and cholesterol. And why? Well, because Exactly, because your body is going to be using those fats in order to produce energy. So, you see, I mean, triglycerides, which is a problem of fatty liver, you're going to be breaking down triglycerides. That's why it's, it's very interesting because um, after three days of fasting, and many of our guests in the Lifestyle Center, 
after a week, the levels of triglycerides goes up. And the levels of cholesterol goes up. And they get concerned by saying, well, no, really, you shouldn't be concerned. That is just um, showing us that the fasting is working. Why? Because it seems like uh, you have more mobilization of fat from your tissues into your bloodstream in order to produce energy, right? So, um, yes, total cholesterol levels are going to drop. And, for example, we have in 2001 one study with 174 uh, patients with high blood pressure. Um, all those patients were able to achieve blood pressure sufficient to eliminate the need for medication and more than 90% became normotensive, right? We have another, um, another um, study, 2002, 30 patients with a high blood pressure participating in the residential health education program that include a supervision of what? Water only fasting for an average of 14 days, 14 days, okay? after these 14 days of fasting, they could decrease the cost of their medications up to $3,000 a year. What about diabetes? Diabetes, obesity and diabetes. Diabetes, diabetes right? Over the last 25 years, oh, sorry, over the last 25 years, type two diabetes have successfully fasted with subsequent reduction or elimination of required medications. And we review already why you are going to be reversing diabetes, because the problem of diabetes is the fat that is clogging your cells in order to introduce glucose so that insulin is not working proper, right? Because you have a lot of fat in, around your cells. And when you are fasting, you are using those fats to produce energy, right? Jason Funk, he is um, one of a Canadian physician in Canada. Um, he is using intermittent fasting and he is using some other uh, uh, therapies in order to reverse diabetes. Um, Walter Longo, he is right now one of the uh, better uh, exponents or speakers about, or scientists about um, fasting in California, well, he is also using fasting to reverse diabetes and also to, for cancer. Um, he mentions that, well, no, he mentions based on studies, um, and I am not uh, advising chemotherapy, but it seems like uh, chemotherapy and fasting, um, they could work together, and if you advise somebody to work to fast for 120 hours before the prior chemotherapy session, I mean, they can decrease the side effects up to 30 or 40 percent of the medicate, I mean, of these kind of therapies, right? Why? Because it seems, it's not really well understanding now or yet, but it seems like the fasting stage or the fasting mechanisms is going to protect the healthy cells and it's going to leave unprotect the cancer cells. They are not yet um, discovering very well this mechanism, right? But you can read here, perhaps the most famous study in obesity appeared in the Postgraduate Medical Journal in the 1973, which reported the experience of a 27 years old man who fasted without complication for how many, how many days? and lost 276 pounds. You can check this article in, in, the, in the website. And um, after five years, um, he continues, I mean, maintaining this, um, this, uh, this, this, this weight. Um, he just, uh, it was 180 when he finished the, this program, it was 180 pounds. After five years, he just increased up to 196 pounds. And now, um, well, he lost um, 276 pounds, right? Uh, his weight it was around 400 and something pounds, right? Um, interesting thing is that in only in the first four to six weeks, they started to 
with some uh, supplements like a sodium, like a potassium and chloride, but only for the first four to six weeks. After that, he didn't use any supplement. And he was sent in the hospital. He just had like a ambulatory office visit into the clinic, right? So um, it's interesting. Immune and inflammatory disorders. Well, um, 1984, study of 43 patients found significant improvements in grip, strength, pain, swelling of proximal the fingers, the joints fingers, and functional activity after a fast of seven days. Seven days. Inflammation markers like a C-reactive protein or sedimentation rate, they can decrease when you have a seven days fasting. In the lifestyle center, we had a lady with a rheumatoid arthritis and she was fasting every week, I mean five days, five days uh, a week, and for three weeks, she stayed with us for three weeks, and um, she was using many medications for, um, um, for this problem, and after um, this session, I mean, she was not using um, any of the medication, and the pain, she was uh, pain um, free, I can say that, right? Suppressing cancer growth. How we are going to target cancer with fasting and how we are targeting the cancer cells well. Reducing the blood glycemia, the blood sugar in, the, in our blood. Decreasing insulinemia, I mean high levels of insulin. And also enhances the insulin sens sensitization, which means reversing insulin resistance. Reduction of Insulin growth factor one, increasing blood, blood uh, ketone bodies, and also promote autophagia in most cells. What is autophagia? It's just that clear out of all cells that they are producing only toxins. Many of the cells, they have to be um, clearing out because when you have uh, old cells, they are producing many toxins, right? And autophagia is one of the simple ways in order to clear out of these old cells that they are producing only uh, uh, damage, right? Um, by the way, one of the simple ways in order to regenerate every cell, or I would say uh, that immune system cells, is just fasting. There is no medication, there is any herb, there is any other supplement that they can regenerate the immune system cells. After you were born, you cannot regenerate those cells. And the only way is through fasting. And, and when you have like an onion and you are peeling, right, the damaging leaves, and you are just taking out the leaves that they are damaged, right? And you have only this very brilliant or bright onion, well, that's happening with every cell in your body when you are fasting. You are clearing out from cells that your body, or well, that in your body is just causing damaging, right? Condition that force cancer cells to rely more on metabolites and factors that are limited in the blood. Different from healthy cells, most cancer cells, they cannot utilize ketones, bodies, as their primary energy source mainly because they do not usually express enzymes that convert ketones to acetylcholine. They cannot produce ketones into energy, most of the cancer cells, right? We have a case, 57 years old, um, diabetes 2, type 2, obesity, hyperlipidemia, 12 years with insulin, 60 units, um, 30, 30 units in the night or in the afternoon, in the evening, and and 10 units before every meal, plus staglipine and metformin. And when he came with us the first Monday, this was his blood work, fasting blood glucose 173. The hemoglobin A1C, when you have to be around 5.2 or 5.4, I mean, his hemoglobin A1C it was 12.0. Triglycerides, they were 158. Cholesterol, 192. Um, 
he was producing insulin. And this is the thing, the problem is not insulin, the problem is that you are not doing exercise. Because the insulin is going to just activate the transporter, but who is going to move this transporter into the cell is just exercise. Mm -hmm. So after three days of fasting for the first week and after fasting every day during the next weeks, Green's diet, which is most vegetables, um, <laughs> some bathing, exercise, walking, stress management, and the most important, spiritual counseling, spiritual counseling. When he left the Lifestyle Center, after a month, the fasting blood glucose was 101. Before, with insulin and with medications, was 173. When he left, the Lifestyle Center was 101 after a month, without medications and without insulin. The hemoglobin A1C, only one month, it drops like a two a point and a half. Triglycerides from 158 to 80. Cholesterol from 192 to 164, by the, but the HDL went up, the good cholesterol. And C-reactive protein, which is one of the inflammation markers, drops to less than one, which is the, the, the sweet point, I would say. General principles about fasting. Low salt, vegan, high fiber, low fat, low protein, and low sugar before diet, before and after fasting. Rest, rest. Don't, don't spend your energy in another situation. Just rest <coughs> and pray and read your Bible, right? Exercise while fasting is discouraged. Short walks or light stretching is permissible. Sunlight and pure water. Contraindication for fasting, underweight. If you, are, if you know already that, you, that your BMI is below 18.5 or just 18.5, you shouldn't be fasting. If you are pregnant, if you suffer from gout, if you are a type 1 uh, diabetic, um, yes, gout, or if you have a high levels of uric acid, you will need to be careful to be fasting, right? Brothers and sisters, in the Bible, Isaiah 58, <laughs> God is telling to the people of Israel, what is a true fasting? They were fasting almost one day a week, probably. They were covering all these rituals, right? They were doing almost everything. But um, God is telling to the people of Israel, okay, this is a true fasting. And the true fasting is, is in Isaiah 58. And Isaiah 58 mentioned this fasting, it is this not the fast that I have chosen, to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every joke, it is it not to share your bread with the hungry and what you bring to your house, the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. What it says after the verse number eight, it says, then your, your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your reward. But it doesn't stop with this. He continues. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away what? The joke from your midst, the pointing finger, and speaking what? Wickedness. Fasting brothers and sisters is not just about food. It's not just about nutrients or physical nutrients. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall down in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as a noonday. 
The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a, a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Fasting is not about me. It's not about you, but it's about God. Fasting is not about selfishness, but love and benevolence, right? And the most important, brothers, fasting is about love God and love to your neighbor. And this is what? The first and the most important commandment. I pray that God, that you can implement the two elements of fasting, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional. Thank you.